solar system. Hola. Hi, Scott. How are you? Good. How are you? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Hola. Hi, Scott. How are you? Okay. Thank you for joining us today, Scott. You can start your presentation today, and thank you very much for your participation. Thank you. Uh, saludo a todos. Uh, first, I want to thank Dr. Raul Alvarez for uh, the invitation to present tonight, and muchas gracias to Ramon for his technical assistance as well. You just get the first slide up there. to you on some biovigilance work that is happening uh, actually on a global scale and some specific work at the American Association of Tissue Banks uh, in our efforts to uh, coordinate some of the um, improvements in biovigilance. I'm sure you've heard of hemovigilance, uh, which is uh, uh, efforts to identify uh, transfusion, blood transfusion, blood product uh, adverse events and, and reactions. And biovigilance addresses organs uh, and tissues for transplantation as well as cell therapy products for infusion, transfer of uh, even uh, reproductive cells. So at the AATB, of course, we deal with conventional tissues. And we're working on a guidance document um, that's titled Identifying, Reporting, and Investigating a Tissue Recipient Adverse Reaction. So I'll be reporting on that as well as a WHO initiative called Project Notify and its library. Next. Next slide, please. Um, this is our guidance document cover, and uh, it's been it's taking a couple of years to develop this guidance document. Uh, there's a lot of information and guidance in it. Um, and if uh, we go to the next slide, we're actually on uh, draft 16, as you can see there. Next slide. Our goal is to educate clinicians. Uh, in a different, a couple of different ways. We'd like to um, provide guidance on recognition, the proper recognition of a suspected allograft caused adverse reaction. Also, we want to describe reporting responsibilities because communication and uh, uh, experiences with reports and investigations, uh, there are communication gaps that occur early on after a report is made, it's often very difficult to get more information uh, from the hospital or the uh, clinical team. The guidance document will also address expectations for cooperation all the way through to closure of the investigation. And it's very important to uh, promote non-punitive concepts in the whole process. Uh, it's thought that uh, if there is a suspected adverse reaction due to a, a, a disease transmission, uh, they might not go reported because of uh, the punitive effects that that can have on a, a hospital or a surgical team. So uh, it's very important that uh, we think of other recipients who might be at risk if it truly is a, a reaction caused by the allograft. Next. 
Now, of course, the tissue bank's involvement, we need to be more uniform in the way we handle reactions or reports of reactions. Uh, there are certain communication responsibilities the tissue bank professionals have with regulators um, and with other tissue banks because donations uh, in the U.S. are often shared among a couple of specialized uh, tissue bank processors. We also want to have uh, timelines established so the investigation moves uh, quickly, as quickly as possible through the process to closure. And also uh, we're looking at uh, using terms that are more universally recognized, such as those uh, in, that were developed in Europe uh, in the USTIDE project, which uh, was a three-year project to develop uh, some similar uh, methods for recognizing and reporting uh, adverse reactions due to tissues and cells. We also realize definitely that there are international implications with a report of an adverse reaction and there could be uh, recalls initiated that are, are very actually widespread. Next. Our table of contents over the past two years as we've been developing this guidance uh, has changed and it's been reduced to what you see there on one page. We decided to uh, work primarily on um, disease transmission and to address uh, those kinds of reports. Um, but we will address later in a version two uh, graph failures because that is another uh, adverse outcome that could occur and uh, needs to be investigated. So you can see the different sections. Um, if you click on the mouse, you'll get a prompt, I think. There you go. You can see in uh, the reporting by the clinician, there are international implications uh, for the clinician as well as uh, the tissue bank. And uh, I wanted to highlight there with other considerations, the tissue distribution intermediaries. Uh, this is a, 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 a tissue establishment type that is much more common today. And when there is an adverse or suspected adverse reaction due to a tissue graft, um, these folks need to understand that uh, they, they need to uh, relay information to the tissue source facility and let them handle the investigation directly. Uh, that can be problematic uh, in experiences that our tissue banks have had and uh, this needs to be clarified and, and we will do that in this document. Next. Next slide. I think it went two slides ahead, I believe. We could go back one. There you go. Oh, there it is. Um, this is, uh, we're still, we still need more help on our guidance document and um, surgeons can uh, have helped us to develop these as well as the Center for Disease Control and Prevention uh, and the FDA in the U.S. But I would like your input uh, on this slide if uh, Raul could uh, collect information from folks to see what you think about these uh, triggers. Well, we call it recognition criteria and in some parts of the world they call them uh, clinical triggers. But to uh, properly recognize and investigate a possible transmission of disease from an allograft that's suspect, there should be clinical and laboratory evidence. And we have listed here some of the uh, clinical and laboratory evidence for bacterial and fungal uh, transmissions. And you can see there, uh, it's listed as signs of inflammation or infection from or near an operative site within six months of implantation that's associated with at least one of the following. So there will be more um, uh, laboratory evidence and clinical evidence. And you can see that fever is listed here, positive culture or gram stain from within the operative site or from perilent drainage, and also a positive, it could be, or a positive blood culture with consideration for other sources for patient bacteremia. In part B, you can see our uh, instructions for parasitic or viral. Um, and you can see the symptoms that are listed there that you might expect. 
And uh, this is actually um, parsed out to a year post him. Or this be associated with. So if you can uh, have any ideas for improving these uh, triggers, uh, please contact me. Next. Um, the CDC, as I mentioned, and FDA helped us with these triggers. The rationale are, are listed here. Um, they're manageable with reasonable sensitivity. Six months was selected because it's evidence-based from organ and tissue transplant infection investigations. And it was realized that allograft removal has not been a factor uh, in these kinds of uh, cases as an indicator of transmission of disease. Next. Uh, the symptoms and cases that were reviewed to develop those were recognized between 2 and 113 days post-op. Patients were readmitted uh, normally within 30 days of surgery. And when you think about it, uh, in most cases that have been proven, there were unexpected organisms from the wound or site that were cultured. And think about the cases that have been reported. Uh, there have been environmental contaminants which you would definitely not normally see uh, in a patient. Uh, Clostridium, of course, is a, a one to mention here, and Elizabeth Kingia meningosepticum, uh, which is a waterborne bug. And uh, that's important for the clinician. Once you get a report of something extremely uh, unexpected, then that would be a cause uh, to suspect the allograft. Next. We are developing uh, uh, triggers for uh, malignancy um, transmissions, but again, that's not been reported for tissue grafts. And, uh, you know, reports go back to uh, of transmissions of diseases as far back as 1954 for hepatitis B. Um, but malignancy with the highly processed grafts today, and like you saw uh, that uh, Raul presented in the uh, demineralized bone matrix. Uh, plus a carrier graphs, there's just not going to be a possibility of, of that type of transmission at all. Uh, but we will have some ideas for recognition uh, in this guidance document. And even more rare would be uh, human transmissible spongiform encephalopathy transmission. But we do have some uh, uh, clinical and uh, laboratory uh, uh, triggers that will be listed. Like I mentioned, graft failure will be addressed later, and uh, we'll be looking at hypersensitivity and toxicity reactions, um, structural failures, uh, and we need to consider, of course, compliance by the recipient in those cases. But that will be version two probably in, in 2015, uh, I would say at least. Next. We do want to complete this guidance this year. Uh, realistically, I believe it will be the first quarter of 2014. Uh, we will reach out to professional societies, uh, AAOS, AOSSM, um, and of course your, your association, and uh, we'll want feedback from you before we finalize it. So look for that, and uh, Raul, I will um, utilize you to uh, distribute that for us, if, if I may. We are considering a focus on vigilance and surveillance for tissue allograft types that pose the most risk. If you've heard Ted Eastland speak, he does give a very good presentation uh, and shows that transmission of disease have been primarily associated with fresh, frozen, or cryopreserved tissues. And uh, I was interested to see the uh, talk on irradiation and um, many graphs, even if they're frozen uh, today, tendons uh, and ligaments are terminally sterilized in their final package uh, using uh, very low doses of uh, radiation, gamma radiation. So we're, we shouldn't be seeing uh, infections occurring with you today, but sometimes systems can fail, and uh, that's what we need to be vigilant, uh, to be looking for those rare occurrences. So we will be looking to many uh, other stakeholders to disseminate this guidance. And uh, we want to be cognizant that there are regulatory bodies and um, 
in each country uh, where the event might have occurred could be one country such as Mexico and uh, the processor and the tissue bank as a national system they must follow in the United States for these events and we must uh, work, work together and cooperate and, and meet the expectations of both uh, systems. Uh, next. So uh, my second topic is uh, on the project Notify, actually the library. Uh, this stems from a, a, a meeting, a couple of meetings that were hosted by the World Health Organization along with uh, a uh, European uh, group, uh, the so uh, SOHO BNS, which is the Substance of Human Origin Vigilance and Surveillance Project, as well as the Transplant uh, National Transplant Center uh, of Italy. Um, so this is a, a very interesting meeting, a gathering of organ, uh, tissues, and cells experts to develop uh, guidelines for um, uh, building vigilance systems. Um, this document is 133 pages long. Uh, if you go to the next slide, I can show you where to get it. It's free. It's actually from a journal, an online journal called Organs, Tissues, and Cells. So if you go to their website at www.organsandtissues.net, uh, you will be able to access this uh, uh, document. And it's in uh, November 2011, volume 14, number three. So I encourage you to, uh, all, all of us as uh, transplant professionals and donation professionals uh, should have this, uh, this fine report. Next. So uh, one of the uh, results of this project was a library. Uh, basically, it's a collection of reports of adverse events and adverse reactions. Um, you can go to the internet at http www.notifylibrary.org. Um, it's still being built. Uh, there is uh, there is a good functionality to it right now, and I'm going to show that some of that to you. Um, you can see that there is a search library tab, uh, the third one from the left. And uh, that's where I'll take you uh, as we walk through just two examples. But uh, these professionals, if you go to the next slide. There was an international editorial board that was uh, created from participants in the Notify project. And you can see uh, the, we addressed it in sections, infections, malignancy, genetic, living donor problems and process problems. I was involved, uh, am involved in the uh, process uh, problems. And that's why I mentioned that we can have uh, very good quality programs in place, but uh, human error occurs uh, in the process and uh, can uh, lead to breaking down these uh, some of these barriers of safety that we have set up. So you can see the names there. You might know some of those folks, uh, transplant surgeons are there, of course. And, uh, and others. And this is for organs, tissues, and cells. Uh, next slide. Our job was to review um, all of these reports, and there are hundreds of them, and see if they qualify as something for the library uh, for you as a clinician uh, to be aware of, and you can uh, search uh, and find information um, that might be uh, actually helpful for a patient and symptoms that your patient has now. Uh, and what I have done here is gone to the uh, search library tab, entered that I'm looking up a serious adverse reaction, uh, not a serious adverse event. And there, is a, there are definitions on this website. You're looking for uh, a recipient, not like a, a living donor uh, reaction. It's an infection, it's bacterial, and I selected enterococcus from the pull-down list. The substance type would be tissue, non-ocular, allogeneic, musculoskeletal, and bone. So if you hit search, after that, you need to get what's on the next slide. There was one record um, that's uh, been, in, been accepted into the library. Uh, this one, unfortunately, doesn't list a latency period, uh, the time from transplant 
important to time of recognition. Uh, there's a little bit there about alerting signals. Uh, that's This is not an excellent example, but you can see there's a reference uh, over to the right, and if you click on that, you can find the publication. And uh, if you go to the next slide, that will lead you to that one. And this is a, from a USTITE pilot report that's available, uh, and it's, it's accept, accessible by clicking on that, but we won't do that here today. Now, if you go to the next slide, it's another uh, report I'd like to show you as an example. And this is a reaction, recipient, the infection is viral, and the disease agent is hepatitis C. And now we're looking at musculoskeletal allogeneic tissue, but it's a tendon or ligament. So how many would be in the system uh, today for this? Go to the next slide. It says there are two records. Now what I will do tomorrow is go to my colleagues um, uh, at the library and report that uh, there's a duplicate record in here because it should only be one. Uh, if you look at this report, it gives a latency period of six weeks from the time of surgery to the time it was recognized, and there's a reference there. But let me show you record two. It's actually the same report, but in more detail. If you go to the next slide. Now, this is more of uh, what we want to have the library do for you, and that is to give you very good information on this case uh, there's a, the alerting signals uh, are there, um, all of the highlights of the report, uh, and you can see that there were uh, lots of graphs and, uh, and organs that were involved from this one donor that transmitted hepatitis C. You probably recognize this reference if you go to the next slide. It's Tuggles' uh, reference from the Annals of Internal Medicine. Now, this was published in 2005, and I just want to make a point that those cases uh, actually occurred in 2002 and 2003, and uh, it's when they were recognized. So we haven't had a hepatitis C transmission um, uh, in a musculoskeletal graft uh, that was reported and proven uh, for o over a dozen years. So that's actually a very good safety record, and I thought I would point that out. And if you go to the next slide, I just want to thank you again, muchas gracias, for uh, inviting me to present and, and be part of your program. Thank you. Thank you, Scott, for your participation. Um, I'm going to, to say something to the president of the college. Uh, Scott, había eh, está promoviendo eh, enviar algunos documentos para que nosotros podamos hacer para que nosotros las alertas sanitarias. La logística en México todavía no está bien estructurada, esto lo estaba haciendo el Centro Nacional de Transplantes, pero es muy interesante tener este recurso del Notify Library para que cualquiera de, de los que trabajan con injertos o matrices óseas o cualquier otro sustituto notifiquen, a lo mejor a través del colegio, no lo sé, y entonces o ustedes por iniciativa propia eh, tratar de notificar a esta, a esta página que está en desarrollo en la Comunidad Europea con algunos, eh, algunos países de América y a lo mejor poder conocer más cómo se comportan los injertos a nivel mundial y si realmente nosotros tenemos algún adver, un, un evento adverso relacionado a los injertos. Eh, sí. Es una, eh, un comentario relacionado justo con esto. De hecho, ya en México ya estamos obligados los máximos de tejidos a recortar a, a través del comité de seguridad y es a partir de abril sí. del año pasado, perdón, de este año, ya estamos obligados a recortar a Cumbres cualquier evento de que se presente o cualquier situación que se presente. Y es por eso que las hojas de aplicación clínica que tienen varios datos, es justo para eso, para poder dar trazabilidad, ya no es opcional, es porque lo tiene la Así es, de hecho, el Centro Nacional de Transplantes lo hace por una doble vía. 
a través del paciente donador o el equipo procurador y el equipo tra de trasplantes. Entonces, siempre conectan el órgano que se donó con el órgano que se trasplantó. Desafortunadamente, nosotros no estamos acostumbrados a notificar esa, muchas veces esa hoja que precisamente ustedes envían como bancos de tejidos, la perdemos o ni siquiera se anexa al expediente. Y como estábamos escuchando de, de Scott, nos decía que el periodo de seguimiento puede llegar a ser hasta seis meses o 113 días. Entonces, es importante que después de haber implantado un tejido, sigamos al paciente o el comportamiento del tejido para precisamente descartar que existe algún efecto adverso o un evento adverso ante esto. ¿no? Y si ocurre, determinar si fue por factores asociados al paciente o fue por factores asociados precisamente al tejido. Entonces, yo creo que es un, un buen momento para comenzar a hacer eh, la notificación a nivel local y a lo mejor una propuesta que salga del colegio para el Centro Nacional de Trasplantes y empezar a trabajar con organizaciones tan importantes como la Asociación Americana de Bancos de Tejidos. Sí, pero los ortopedistas no lo hacen a nivel nacional, aunque sea una obligación. Sí, porque no se ha dado. Sí, pero no se ha dado difusión suficiente a esto. Entonces. Sí. Sí. Pero precisamente para eso son estas sesiones académicas, para que se dé eh, más énfasis a esas cosas. Que los bancos de tejidos, los, yo no, no creo que lo, tengan alguna duda con ello, pero al menos la comunidad ortopédica no conoce una gran cantidad de estos aspectos. Bueno, thank you Scott for your participation. It's a polemic participation here. We are going to continue with our session. Thank you very much and I hope to see you the next year in Mexico City.